At this point, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our Africa.com Chairman and CEO, Teresa Clark. Thank you. This is the first hybrid event that Africa.com has hosted. And we are thrilled to have the opportunity to do this with our partners at the Gates Foundation. Now we want to tell you a little bit about what is going on and what the context is for this particular meeting. Right now, the Commonwealth Heads of Government are meeting in Rwanda. This is a meeting that takes place every two years among all of the heads of government within the Commonwealth so that they can look at their common interests and see how they could work together. This meeting was originally scheduled for 2020, but for obvious reasons was delayed until now. The last Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting took place in London in 2018. Now, like such important meetings where we have the heads of government assembling, we also have many important side meetings. And there's a very important side meeting going on on the sidelines of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting on malaria and tropical diseases. And it's in this context that both Melinda Gates and Chimamanda Adichie, as well as our other three keynote experts on public health from Rwanda are meeting in Rwanda today. So while they are there looking at how to advance in particular the interests of women in health, they've been generous enough to agree to spend their time to talk about this very important topic with our virtual audience. We have two groups in our audience today. We have a group of VIPs who we'd like to welcome who are there on camera and you will see them as part of our virtual audience. And in addition, we have our very loyal and traditional audience from Africa.com who is joining us in large numbers. I think that we have well over a thousand who are with us already. So that is a bit of the background on what we're doing today. And I'm very excited that we have a fantastic moderator who will be leading the session, Janet Mbua from Kenya, who is a media personality and celebrity in East Africa, will be moderating the session. Janet, can I turn it over to you? Yes, thank you so much, Teresa. And it's so lovely to see each and every one of you. I think Teresa's done an amazing intro over there. So I will not go over some of what she's covered, but I would like to officially welcome each and every one of you to this really pertinent and critical conversation. And as our colleague earlier mentioned, it is a virtual discussion on equity and innovation for Africa's recovery. I'm really sad that I couldn't be there in studio with you all, but I will spend the next four minutes or so introducing myself a little bit and then introducing our esteemed panelists so I can see our setup in the room. And we're so excited to be with you today. Uh, my name is Janet Bogwa. I'm a media personality, author, and global menstrual justice and gender equality advocate through my Inuadata Foundation. I'm coming to you live from Nairobi, Kenya, and excited to have you all with us for this pertinent conversation on the sidelines of Chodom. It's important that we address the importance of equity in responding to health challenges while highlighting ways to promote health innovation on the African continent, in particular, removing barriers that prevent women and girls in the health space. We have such remarkable women on our pa panel, global champions of women's rights. And as I begin to introduce them, I'd also like them to know that even though we have a very short time within which we can ensure that everyone's input of this rich discussion is felt, this is a conversation. So feel free at any point to respond or react to any one of your fellow panelists' remarks by simply motioning me, uh, maybe a small show of hand throughout this conversation. So let's treat this more as a conversation as opposed to a very static kind of like Q&A uh, to everyone. It is now my honor to introduce our panelists today. First, we have Melinda French Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Melinda French Gates is a philanthropist, businesswoman, and a global advocate for women and girls. And as co-chair of the foundation, she shapes and approves the organization strategies and overall direction, reviews results, and works with grantees and partners to further the foundation's goal of improving equity in the United States and of course, around the world. Melinda French Gates, it's an honor to have you with us and really great to see you. Thank you for being in the room. 
Then we have Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. She is from Nigeria and is an award-winning author of multiple books. She's delivered two landmark TED Talks, The Danger of a Single Story, and We Should All Be Feminists, which started a worldwide conversation about feminism and was published as a book in 2014. I think I have that pocketbook somewhere in my bag as well. Chumamanda was named one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. Chumamanda, it's an honor to have you with us in the room today. Thank you for joining Thank us as part you. of this conversation. Um, we have Memory Kachamba, who's also going to be coming to us virtually, the executive director for FemNet. Memory is an intersectional feminist, a women's rights activist, with over 18 years of experience working on issues of gender development, women's empowerment, and human rights at an African and global level. She's a dynamic Pan-African feminist, thought leader and strategist, and passionate about making a difference in the lives of women and girls through diverse approaches. Memory, thank you for being with us, joining me virtually, uh, streaming into this amazing conference. And our two other panelists, we have Dr. Shivon Biamukama, Managing Director of Babel Rwanda. She's responsible for implementing the company's in-country strategy. Prior to this, she was the company secretary and head of corporate affairs at the Bank of Kigali, responsible for the bank's legal affairs and implementing good corporate governance practices. And it's a pleasure to have her with us as well in this discussion. Thank you so much for being with us. Then we have Dr. Corinne Karema, Interim CEO of RBM Partnership to End Malaria. Dr. Corinne Karema is the first woman to serve as the head of Global Malaria Organization as the new Interim CEO of the RBM Partnership to End Malaria, the largest global platform for coordinated action to end malaria and comprised of 500 partners worldwide. Thank you so much for being with us in the room and we look forward to hearing from all of you. I would like to spend another brief moment to hand back over to Teresa Clark to briefly uh, give us a little bit of insight into who we have in the space and in one of the rooms before she hands it back over to me to proceed with the panel discussion, Teresa. Thank you, Janet. And as I said in my earlier remarks, this is the first time we're doing something hybrid and we are so excited to see all of you sitting there in Kigali, having left the important meetings that you are attending today. All of you are together in one room. And then we have over a thousand people who represent over 100 countries around the world. We have people coming in from over 40 countries on the continent of Africa, as well as over 60 countries throughout the world, largely from the ones outside of the, of the continent are mainly coming in from the US, from the UK, from Europe. We also have very special guests who you see on camera. And I don't know if the um, director there in uh, Kigali can put that screen on, but I'd like to just show the uh, pictures of the people who are here, as well as just a quick uh, slide to show you the names of the people who are here. So this gives you a sense of who is in the room. This is our special guest to those who have agreed to be here in person, as it were, for this hybrid. So you can see that we have people from the public sector, people from the private sector, people from the NGO community, and a good number of people who are focused on public health. We also want to give a special welcome to the optimists from the Gates Foundation, who are very good friends of that institution. And um, we welcome all of you here today. We're going to do our very best to make this an interactive session. Um, and with that, Janet, I give it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Teresa. We're excited to uh, see a lot of people from different parts of the world and excited to kick off this conversation. Um, I'll begin by speaking to, to Melinda about this. And there's even questions that were coming in earlier for a lot of our panelists, especially with regards to their area of passion and expertise. Uh, you know, Melinda, several countries missed the mark on gender inclusive recovery. I think we saw that in so many different parts of the world, there was lockdowns and curfews, but there wasn't really a gender lens that was attached to that. And as the continent, particularly Africa, continues to recover from the pandemic um, in building more innovative and resilient health systems, why is it important that African girls and women are at the forefront of post COVID health and economic policies, especially given that there seemed to be a lack of a gender lens when it came to including them 
in recovery? Okay, I think it's a really important question. I think one thing we have to all consider is that, you know, before COVID-19 broke out, we had seen, we are still seeing huge momentum across the continent of Africa, right? Malaria deaths are down, immunization rates are up, fewer children are dying, fewer women are dying. What happened though during COVID-19 is a lot of that progress was either stalled or some of it went backwards like malarial deaths. But one of the things that we saw during COVID was the resilience of women. I guess to me, it wasn't surprising, but I think to some perhaps finance ministers or prime ministers, it might've been surprising. But you know, 70% of healthcare workers are women, right? So when it came to who's gonna go out in the community and give the messages about, okay, the only tool we have right now is hand washing and masks, it was women. When it came to who's gonna make masks, it was women when it came to, okay, vaccines are out. We're going to get them all the way out to the health posts. It was the women who were delivering them. And so I think we see time and again, and we know this, women are the center of the family. Often they're very well regarded in the community, or if they're not, they're still the workers in the community. And then at the global level, we have to make the right policies to empower these women. But it's women who are making investments on behalf of their children. When they get a dollar in their hands a day, they're putting it into their children's health and education or getting themselves a job. So I think we have to, at the global level, look at women and where do we remove the barriers and where do we lift up women? Because we know they lift up their family and they lift up their societies. Right, that's so well said. Where do we remove the barriers? And you've explained it well, you know, we're at the front lines of so many of these issues that come up. And so globally, there should also be that integration into addressing and removing the barriers. And you talked a little bit about resilience and you talked a little bit about progress. And uh, Chimamanda, I'd like to come to you now. And you stated once, if we're going to go deeper into um, health practitioners and those at the front lines, that empathy compels you to imagine the lives of other people and see other people just as human as you are. And you once encouraged public health practitioners not to disregard their own emotions uh, or hide behind the data. Uh, why is it important for practitioners at times to allow their emotions or experiences to guide their work? I don't even remember when I said that. <laughs> this is the problem with talking when you've had a glass of wine, then no. Um, <laughs> I guess, okay. No, I think, so you mean, when do I, why do I think it's important to use the emotions sometimes? Right. Because I, th I think we're human and um, and I think we are not just a collection of logical bones and flesh who deal in, you know, data. We're, we're also human. We have hearts and we and we dream and we um, and because of that, I think there is a connection that we can make with other people when we when we use that ability to empathize and and sympathize. And I think for so long that this idea of using emotions has been I guess maybe um, not encouraged because it's seen as something women do and men don't, which is interesting to me because I actually find that men are much more emotional than women because men are often, <laughs> they have more difficulty controlling themselves. All right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if I've answered the question, but, but I think I, I do want to say that I just lo I love what Melinda said about how it didn't surprise her that women were so resilient. It might have surprised some people. Mm -hmm. um, it's, and it's, I find it really interesting because it's, I think it speaks to what I think is still an, um, an unappreciated quality of women. And, and it may, I sometimes wonder why, you know, you, anecdotally, um, it's so clear that women in general are much more resilient, much stronger, um, much more able to absorb, um, you know, just to absorb the difficulties of life. And it's interesting to me that there are just not more women in positions of leadership where I think these qualities are necessary. And I think it's because yeah. there have been barriers erected over yeah. time yeah. to inadvertently or advertently keep women out. And yet yeah. what we see is when you do get women at some of these highest positions, and all of you on this stage in your position, and we speak out yeah. about what the truth is of what we see because we have a different lens on society. Yeah it makes things better for everybody, for families, right? Yeah. Um, why science has labeled some data 
hard data, that is the numbers, and some things soft data, which is emotions or empathy. When you think about the center of a family, you don't parent your ch your child out of data. Yep. You parent your child out of empathy and emotion, but we need both. Yeah. Data to know where to act, but emotions help us to act. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. No, I, I agree with Melinda so and Timamanda. So when we, we, we look at, for instance, women in Rwanda uh, with the COVID, most of our women, I think 90% of community health workers are female. And those were the brave women that were going door to door to distribute mosquito nets, to, to check on the fever test and, and so on. So I think that they were not scared about death, but they wanted to save lives. And this is really, you know, the motion to be a, a mother, to be a woman and then uh, to, to, to get things done. Yeah. And, and, and generally in healthcare, um, women in a family are sort of like the, the gatekeepers of, of healthcare within a family. Mm -hmm. And they should really be at the forefront of finding solutions. And they've proved that they've, they can uh, through the pandemic to really be at the forefront of finding the solutions that are, are, are relevant uh, for the communities, for their families as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love how you've all sort of organically interweave the empathy element, the data element, the progress element. And I think that's what speaks to the spirit of why we're trying to break down barriers and progress access to health and equity. And uh, Dr. Corinne, just going back to you a little bit, you know, how do you see how your journey in helping pave the way uh, for the next generation? How can African women, if we're talking about barriers, how then do we continue to remove barriers and create pathways for coworkers, for neighbors, as well as nieces, daughters, granddaughters, how do we begin to remove these barriers that we've all raised in this particular discussion? Um, I know that's a little bit of a complex and layered question, but you know, from your own experience, how do we begin to remove those barriers? So, uh, you know, there are many elements, many factors. So the first one, I think it's a, a country leadership. So I can see, I can give the example of Rwanda where women are empowered, women in terms of taking decision of the number of children they want. And then also, um, especially when you look at my story, uh, I, 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 I'm really a living testimony of the progress in terms of the health. Uh, with the three generations, for, in, for instance, of my family, uh, I, if I take the example of my, my, my grandmom, she was she, she she got married when she was 15 years old she had 15 pregnancies three children under five who died with fever that may have been due to malaria but there was no uh, diagnostic and then uh, she didn't choose a husband so she got married she didn't choose a husband my mom she got married when she was 17 years old 12 pregnancies nine living and I have nine, uh, eight siblings and uh, all of us are alive but she had two miscarriage also due to fever and myself I'm sure myself my children I have two wonderful children Perla and Adriano I'm sure they, they, they've got the same health uh, care the same number of vaccine as your children, uh, Melinda and Chivon, I'm sure. I don't know. And uh, I, I've seen the progress in health. And uh, I can testimony that with education, my parents give us the, all the education that help, enable us to, 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 to address all the barriers for women. And I, I, think, that, I think that when you put women uh, at the center, you give all the opportunities. You, you, you give uh, access to health, to education. That makes a different change. Mm -hmm. Did your mother choose her husband? No, but I did. I was a medical <laughs> doctor. <laughs> she didn't, but my, my dad is the wonderful dad and husband she could have. Yeah. So I guess it worked out. Yeah, yeah. it did. That was still an important question to ask because it comes down to, to choice as one way <laughs> to break down the barrier. So when Chimamanda asked, did she choose? Um, it's important that that comes out as well. Uh, thank you for speaking and giving us that sort of like the lineage and how that's progressed over time. I think that's so important. Um, I'd like to bring in Memory. Uh, memory is also joining us virtually. And Memory, you've also said in the spirit of speaking about breaking down barriers and even moving to agency, because that's also so critical in allowing women to access, um, 
you said you cannot speak from both corners of your mouth and apply double standards as you purport to speak for women and who said women cannot speak for themselves mm -hmm. so how do we place african women at the forefront of growth and economic policies are there examples where you've seen this have a positive impact on africa's recovery memory There we go, memory. Oh, th thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, um, and I actually don't remember that, but it's always great <laughs> when you're quoted. Yeah. And I just wanted to go a little bit back to what Melinda had talked about in terms of resilience and just share an example of uh, what some women, um, we work with women in, in Kenya, in Mombasa, and there's a group of women living, uh, working with persons with disability. And one of the innovations they did during COVID was to develop masks, uh, which had a transparent um, uh, face so that they could um, actually uh, communicate because most of the communication for people who use lips uh, was not visible. So it's interesting how women are always also innovating mm -hmm. in terms of, um, you know, coping and bringing up uh, during resilience. But back to your question, um, in terms of um, policies and growth, I think I, I would really love to, there's something that Anne-Marie Gautet says about uh, the whole way we define economic growth and that um, economic growth that is high in inequalities, that is high in inequities, um, is violent and should not be accepted as a norm. So I think one thing, even as um, why it's important for women to be at the center in policy development uh, is really because um, women bring in certain elements that would not ordinarily you know, be visible. For example, um, we look at Rwanda, for example, being in Rwanda is very significant with 64% of women in parliament. I think when I was um, researching, one of the things that came out is that they actually have policies for six months maternity, which across the African continent, I mean, this is really commendable. So if we look at women's representation, uh, quality uh, in terms of leadership and progressing policies, I think it's, it's actually important for women to be uh, in decision making and for women to be at the center um, and not being excluded when it comes uh, to policy making. And there have been super examples um, uh, that, 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 that I can also give, for example, in Kenya during the COVID pandemic, uh, we know that um, there was reduction in takes uh, uh, from 14% uh, from 14 to 14% from 16%, which really uh, offered a lot of relief. And also in Kenya, um, there was also wavering for for, for small businesses. And we know that a lot of women are in, um, in informal businesses. So that wavering sort of like provided a bit of a cushion for them. So we know there were women who were actually pushing for those policies um, you know, in coming up. So there are a lot of examples where it is really important to have women um, in, the, in the forefront. Thank you so much for that um, memory, inviting our other panelists to react to that. And um, as you think through just how we're all trying to navigate breaking down barriers and having access at the decision-making level, uh, Dr. Siobhan, how have you seen technology and innovation change how women and girls are gaining access to affordable health and what's been the impact of more equitable healthcare access on their lives and on their communities? Uh, thank you. So one of the biggest or the biggest barriers to access to uh, to healthcare is affordability of healthcare and accessibility of healthcare and there have been a lot of innovation around how do we intervene in health in, in healthcare to support access to that and you can only do that especially if you're using a phone uh, using the phone people already have in their phone so in Africa, where majority of the population uh, have phones, not necessarily smartphones, how do you innovate in a way that the phone that they have in their hand, which is a feature phone, uh, you, can, you can provide access there. Uh, so one of the things that we've done at Babylon is have a technology which can be used by anybody who has a phone 
and the phone can also be shared. So if a husband has a phone within a family, uh, the wife can borrow that phone. And from the comfort of wherever you are, you can be able to, to use our services. Now, we introduced this in March of 2021. And if you compare that, March 2021 to December, to the previous year, the number of women who started using our services grew by 102%. So that was like an opening of an access point to using our services. And when you talk about women's health, you're also talking about children's health because they're the primary caregivers of, 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 uh, of health to their children. So the other thing is that women, you have to be able to provide services in an easy and convenient way. How, if I'm in a market looking after, you know, trying to sell my product, my produce, and, and I have a simple malaria or something that I'm suffering from, how do I ensure that I can quickly get access without losing the economic activity that I am doing, uh, without having to spend hours walking to a health facility to be able to get the care that I need? If I can do that on my phone, then I'm having care right there and then and then if that can be combined with ability on affordability to universal health care that means that i can do it on my market table but i can also afford it because i have universal health care uh 80 percent of rwanda's population uses universal health care and i think the total uh insured population is 87 percent so these are the, some of the things that, that that do help and maybe the final point to say is that we've put together a um, um, uh, call center where we have doctors in Kigali that provide the services that we do. And what that means, and if in Rwanda, the doctor-patient ratio is about one to 8,000. Uh, I think those are similar statistics in, in, in some of the other countries uh, on the continent. And, and that means that even when the ratio is bad, it's even worse in the villages because everybody goes to the city where they can get, you know, their better schools and economic activities. How about getting those doctors, putting them in a room, providing care from where you are so that somebody in the village or everywhere else can now have access to this doctor that they wouldn't have ordinarily um, had access to. So these are some of the innovations that we can put in place to make sure that we unlock uh, the possibility and once you have a healthier woman, because women are, you know, they look after their families and they're, 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 they're um, sort of the ones who are taking care of the, of, of, of the unit of the family, and many units of the family is the country. So it's a healthier nation contributing to economic activities if you really unblock the barriers to healthcare within that family. And I just want to build on this point because I think what Dr. Siobhan is saying is so incredibly important that that phone creates this entire opening in the health system and for women. And, you know, this is a tool, even the feature phone, we didn't have 15 years ago in development. And yet when you look back, M-Pesa was created in Kenya, mm -hmm. and then it went to Tanzania, and then you see it across the continent, you see it in Philippines, Bangladesh, India now, right? That phone is so powerful, even if it's not a smartphone, when a woman can have a digital bank account and save a dollar a day, two dollars a day, get information of at market, my bushel of what I've just grown is going to sell for X number of pesos or dollars or whatever your currency is, and know that the middleman who takes it to market isn't going to take her on the price. She can eventually also get credit on her phone mm -hmm. if you do what Kigali Bank is doing and you hook her all the way up to the banking system. So that phone, we have to make sure that women have the same access to not just phones, but digital accounts and the internet on their phone. If not, we're going to leave women behind. Mm -hmm. And instead, it's an enormous though opportunity when done right in health, agriculture, um, all kinds of things. It is, it's such a special tool and it kind of strikes that balance. I think as Dr. Siobhan was talking about, there's the economic recovery because she's able to access it wherever she is. And also there's the access uh, to informational equitable health. Um, I'd now like to pause here because we have a lot of incredible questions coming in. Um, and I'd now like to ask uh, Teresa if she can begin to feel through any of the questions that are coming into the chat to our panelists. It's important that we also have the other side of the room um, involved and engaged in this conversation. So Teresa, over to you. Great, thank you, Janet. Um, I'd like to go to South Africa. 
Uh, we have a doctor from South Africa, Dr. Teresa Masigwa, who has a question. Um, Teresa, can we hear your question? And if we can't, I'm happy to read it to you. Why don't I just do that in the interest of keeping things moving? I thought we could unmute her faster than that. Um, Teresa's question is given um, that we can all agree that empowering women is what needs to happen and each sector, private, public and nonprofit have different roles to play. How do we drive real practical change on the ground through intersectoral collaboration? moving beyond policy conversations and into creating platforms where women are truly empowered to lead and innovate. What might those platforms look like? I put that out there to the panel. Um, I could start. Uh -huh. uh, one of the things that can be done practically is really around policy. Um, and I'll give an example. I remember um, I have a seven year old and I remember being totally surprised that the first six months of my salary, the first six weeks of my salary got paid and the next six weeks I got uh, 20%. And those diapers are expensive. Mm. <laughs> and, 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 and trying to understand why, because you know, Rwanda is, is, is a country where you know, we put forward women. And what really happened is that small businesses were not employing women because then they're out of pocket because there's three because they're going on maternity leave mm. and so something amazing happened then where now all of us were employed put 0.3 percent of your salary into a basket the company puts 0.3 into a basket the woman gets her three months of maternity leave and the company can claim back from this basket two months of, of salary. And what that means is that the woman has three months of her maternity leave and, uh, and, 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 and can take care of her child. And the, and, and the man is not, not the man, the, the, the small businesses or other businesses are, are, are not shy to employ young women because you know, they are worried about taking out of, poly, of, of pocket. So some of these policies are very, um, necessary. The other one I could give um, in Rwanda, for example, um, so we have, it's written in our, in, 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 in our constitution, so there's 30% contribution of women in everything, including boards. So any board that exists, there has to be 30% uh, representation, and that really forces organizations to, to make sure that women are seated at the table. And, 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 and truly, once you give them the opportunity to sit at the table, you will want 40% because then they, you know, you want 40%, you want 50%. Um, in, in, in my company, our management team is 57% of, of, of my team because women just need to be given the opportunity to show what they really can do. I would agree. I think it's a mix of sound government policy, but you have to have women with a seat at the table to make sound government policy on behalf of other women. Yes. Um, Rwanda is an exemplar in that. I would not say my own country is an exemplar of that yet. Um, so I think you have to have government sound policy. You have to have investment by government, investment by the private sector, and investment and grant making by um, NGOs from outside or nonprofits from outside. Mm -hmm. I'll give an example. I was just in Dakar and Senegal and one of the places I visited many places, but one of them was a women's investment club. It was a woman who started her accounting firm. She eventually sold it to Deloitte and she decided that what she wanted to do with her time to make sure that what she knew in business was meaningful was to start a women's investment club. She brought in all these female entrepreneurs who wanted funding for their businesses. She realized they needed more mentoring till they were actually ready to launch their businesses. She got other business people around them. They mentored these women in their businesses and then they invested in them and they've launched several of them. One of the young women I met was 27 years old. She had the idea of collecting all the tires that were out on the street and grinding up the rubber. And now she's got an entire business where she's selling the rubber for AstroTurf, for underneath AstroTurf and to cement factories because she grinds it down and so the burner they put in is 40 percent less carbon emission and she's got an enormous business on her hands she's being asked to provide rubber to all kinds of places all over west africa but without that initial 
mentoring, sponsoring, and investing, her business wouldn't grow that way. And so, so often we don't see women-led businesses or we're afraid to invest in them. And we need to have more investment capital going into women-led businesses. Yeah, I agree that with uh, leadership as well as policy. And uh, I think also uh, in, within our family, we need to inspire girls. We need to inspire the little girls to, to, to dream big mm -hmm. and then achieve their, their dream. And I think it's really important that on top of mentorship, you also have education. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. yeah, when a girl is educated, she can reach very far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to, I mean, what you said about families and, and urging girls to dream, I think is so important. I find myself really interested in the cultural part of things. What, what are the cultural barriers that exist? Mm -hmm. um, and so when you were talking about the 30% women, mm -hmm. the first thing I thought was, how did that go? Was there backlash? How do the women feel? Because I think often, um, because our society is so male, not just male dominated, but male appeasing. Mm -hmm. There's often this idea, you know, so women get into positions of power and they're dealing with not just the normal things, they're dealing with other layers of things. Do you really deserve to be here? Mm -hmm. um, you know, a woman does something that a man would do, she's judged differently. Mm -hmm. And often that judgment doesn't come only from men. Mm -hmm. So, and, and so in Nigeria, for example, I'm struck by how there's a lot of talk about female empowerment and, you know, we're, but, but I feel as though we're not really talking about the things underneath, the ways in which we tell girls, you can do anything, be strong. But on the other hand, we're very quick to cut girls down and cut women down when they dare to be ambitious, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm really interested in how do we, you know, telling stories that make it normal mm -hmm. so that women who occupy positions of power are not extraordinary. They're just, you know, ordinary. You know, to make it normal and also that these other little cultural things you know when i when i asked if your mother um chose her husband it's because my grandmother did not choose her husband my mother did and and, and i feel that even that is a switch that but today we're choosing our husbands my generation younger than me but there's still there's still problems you know there's mm -hmm. still if you're a successful woman in nigeria and you do an, an interview um you're expected to say my husband allowed me. You're expected to say, my husband blessed my effort. There's always that expectation that you somehow have to give a certain kind of credit. Mm -hmm. you, you, you cannot take it all, all on your own. You and yeah, and, and these are cultural ideas that continue to exist. And I'm always thinking about how do we, you know, how, would you, how do we shift it? So we need the policies, of course, we need, and we really need telling girls to dream mm -hmm. as well as telling boys that it's okay for girls to dream yes, right because yes, yes, yes. i mean i don't know how how i mean rwanda i'm so impressed i mean mm -hmm. I'm, I'm feeling a bit ashamed as a nigerian right now but i'm also wondering how um whether mm -hmm. this increased representation of women in rwanda mm -hmm. has had any i mean do we have an increase in divorces are men I've... feeling <laughs> are their egos so fragile and shrunken that they cannot bear to or are they doing okay so I think that the, the increases in divorces um, could be there, yeah. and I, I think they could be there, but I think that generally it's really a trend of, that is changing globally, at least in Africa, uh, of, of, of your, if something is happening and they're like, oh, no, you have to take it. That's how men are. That's how it is. Yes. And then because women are getting more empowered, they're like, no, no, yes, it's yes. not. It's yes. not. I, 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 I'm a woman and this is yeah. unacceptable. Yeah. And, 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 and I think that that is when people are empowered to make, you know, respectable choices for themselves. And, and so divorces, yes, do happen. And I think it's not just in Rwanda, but everywhere. Mm -hmm. But it's really, a, 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 I mean, culturally i mean when you speak to you know uh he, he you know this and this happened to me and and then he bit me and then that's how men are yeah. or you know this happened to me you know he had an affair or something oh but that's how you know but but you're saying no this is you know yeah. so yes i think that generally people stand women standing up for themselves yeah. and basically knowing what is and is not uh good good for themselves but i think for rwanda mm -hmm. I dare say that there might be another explanation. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know whether it's, but this is my thinking. Mm -hmm. um, given our history, uh, we, we, so two things. So given our history, when 
there was the liberation struggle. Um, everyone participated. So men went to the better front. Women were nurses or helping. Women were fundraising. Um, we used to dance, culture dance, and really to just everything was, you know, every person was participating. And I think in building the constitution, the women had a seat at the table in making sure that those policies do exist. So there are certain policies that have been put in place. For example, um, in, in Rwanda, a man will not go and get a loan if they own 100% uh, uh, property with their husband without the wife's consent. Because the wife will say, no, I am 50% owner of this property. It cannot be mortgaged. So literally, you will win a case against a bank if the wife's consent was not sought wow. on property that is owned, uh, the family. And when you're even getting married, uh, the choice at the point of signing is made do you want to share your property moving forward? Do you want to, you have yours, you have yours. We now move together and now we own everything after we get married. Do you want to separate? So that there are three regimes and you have to make a choice at the point of getting married. And if you're asking for a loan, you will have to give your marriage certificate because if it's 50-50, she has to consent. And if you don't get her consent, the woman will say, I did not give my consent. This is not mortgaged. So you have sort of like those things that make the woman really, yeah. you know, own her place uh, 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 as well. And also, I guess because the genocide happened, yeah. very many people died, very many, many men were in prison. And then you, who was, who was running the economy, who was running the policies, who was looking after the children, it is the woman. And I think that it was an opportunity to then show, as I said, this is what women can do. And so, uh, and I remember, I think on Women's Day, when the president said, no, the right of a woman is not a favor. Yes. It's not a favor. Yes. This is something that you're entitled yes. to yes. because we represent 51% of the population and we really need to sit at the table, not as a favor. Yeah. Bravo. And then it becomes <laughs> the norm, right? I, see, yeah, I wish it were the norm. norm. It's a, yeah. Yes. This yeah. Is, it changed the norm. Yeah. <laughs> if, we, if we think about, so it's, for us, it's not yeah. 50, you know, 60% women in parliament, but half the cabinet ministers are women. If I think about even private sector, the CEO of Bank of Kigali, the biggest bank is a woman, the, the, the CEO, like, like there are maybe 12 banks, five are CEOs are women. It's getting to a place where a woman, and a man can lead an organization. As a young girl, I feel like I could aspire mm -hmm. to anything that I, I would like to. And, and yes, I mean, you know, there will be jokes on the street to say, oh my God, women are taking over. But the reality is they're not taking over, they're owning their seat yes. where it should be. Yeah. And then it becomes the norm and everybody yes. just sees it that way. Yeah. And as you said, then young girls can see all yeah. these women and say, I want to be like be any expensive. one of those women, a scientist, a banker. Yeah. No, I think, I think okay. when I we have another question coming in. I'm so sorry. I realize that we're short on time. And so I want to make sure we get all these questions in. And um, when you respond this next time, we're going to ask all the speakers to try to use the opportunity to also include your Conclusive, concluding remarks in your response. Um, the question that we have next is coming from Malshi Shagun, who's the head of Human Rights Watch in Africa. And the question is a very difficult one, and it is about schoolgirls who fall pregnant. We all know that this is a challenge. How do we make sure that they're able to continue their education and their, and their, and their health care? How do we make sure that girls who are pregnant across Africa um, get what they need to move forward with their lives. And can we start with, um, can we put it out there to Chimama and Melinda to get your views before we hear the, the policy experts? I think Melinda can. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think we need to recognize, well, first of all, I think if we make sure that girls are educated about their bodies, fully educated, and that we offer a basket of different tools, that is contraceptives, and they're educated, they're less likely to become pregnant. So I think one, that the onus is on us as a community, as a development community, as governments, a private sector, to make sure that girls are educated and have that information. But if they fall pregnant, 
then I think, you know, it's making sure that they're still welcomed at school. They're not stigmatized. They can leave when they need to and take, you know, time off, but then come back. I think so often we stigmatize girls as if it was their fault they got pregnant. No, there were two people in that equation. There wasn't just one. And so why should the boy be able to still go to school, but the girl can't, right? And so instead of shaming girls and saying, oh, you know, you have a baby, we're going to put you away somewhere, you're never going to be back in school. No, we should say, okay, you know, you're going to continue your schooling. You may take a bit of time off to breastfeed the baby and then you come back. I don't know. I'm sure others have no, more no, to say no. on I, this. I, I agree with you. And this is where you see where leadership comes. We have seen in Tanzania, mm -hmm. you know, before girls were not going back to school where they were pregnant. But once the president became a lady, President Hassan changed. Mm -hmm. The first policy was to bring back them to school because education will help them, as you say, to prevent pregnancy and then to become mm -hmm. the best they can be. Yeah, that's why we need more women leaders. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, absolutely. I, I feel quite strongly as well about educating girls about their bodies. I mean, mm -hmm. I think and again, I think it goes back to my thinking about cultural ideas that we have. And mm -hmm. I think because this is a continent that and, and, and also how, how linked it is to religion and religious ideas. And we're such a religious continent yes. and how often we use religion as um, as a kind of reason not to talk about things. And mm -hmm. and I find myself thinking about how we can use religion as a reason to talk about things. Mm -hmm. So I've actually often talked about wanting to craft a Christian feminism because Christianity is such a strong force in Nigeria. And often people will quote the Bible to sort of put women down. And so when it comes to women's um, and young girls' bodies, even talking about periods, I think, mm -hmm. is still a thing that's that's sort of covered in shame. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your period starts and you're supposed to be ashamed and you, do you have a, a, a cardigan so I can tie it and hide? And I'm thinking, no, it's a normal thing. It's just like sweating, right? <laughs> it's, it's, and this idea that there's so much shame linked to the female body. Mm -hmm. I, I feel as though it's so important for us to find ways to talk about it more again make it ordinary mm -hmm. periods um you know what happens what is sex how do you get pregnant i remember when i was growing up in osoka and i grew up in a very progressive community in a university and we had a and an, a thing was organized where young girls were supposed to be told about you know was sex education mm -hmm. but you know really what we were told don't let a boy touch you because you will get pregnant yes. <laughs> and if I hadn't spent all my early years reading books that I had no business reading, I would really have thought that if a boy touches you, you get pregnant, mm. you know? And so, and I'm talking about a progressive community, mm. <laughs> really. And I think that even, even for my generation of, of Nigerians, mm. and, I, and I'm going to say maybe most Africans mm. who have children, there's still a discomfort about talking to our daughters about, because we inherited shame mm. and it's hard for us not to pass on that shame. You know, and I remember actually getting very upset with my cousin recently because her daughter, who is three, was running around naked and my cousin said to her, go and cover yourself. And I just thought, she's just three. Mm -hmm. Just let her be, you know, already you're making this female, this tiny female person feel that something is wrong with having a female body. But the little boy runs around whenever he wants to. And of course, I'm not saying we should let girls run around naked. <laughs> I'm really just saying that yes. I think talking about the female body, talking about what it means to have a female body, to live in the world with a female body, because there's so many consequences mm -hmm. to it. I, I really, I'm interested in, in having more of those conversations on this continent. And that it's yeah. beautiful. It's yeah. beautiful and it does the <laughs> most <laughs> magnificent things. Yes, it creates a baby. Yeah. It, it is incredible to me. No, honestly, until I had a baby, I, I mean, I've always thought women were wonderful, mm -hmm. but then I got pregnant and had a baby and I thought, women have been doing this and somehow they've been okay and they've just been really and they've done it 15 times yes. my mother did it seven times i mean yeah we, we also need i mean celebrating the female form acknowledging the ways in which it affects how we live and i think that goes then into teaching girls you know what sex is and when they get pregnant not to shame them i mean it's so it's wonderful what melinda said it takes two but we the minute pregnancy happens we forget the boy yeah. you know it's Absolutely. yeah we forget the boy it's the girl and the shame heaped on her. I remember this um, girl who got pregnant in Osoka and chose to have the baby. And people were so just horribly vitriolic to her. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, well, first of all, it's because she chose to have hers. I mean, we don't know how many people, you know, if you're sexually active, there's a possibility of her getting pregnant. Yes. But the second thing was how people then said things like her child will not be mentally well developed because the child was born out of marriage. And I mean, you, and I'm talking about a progressive community. So you can imagine what would happen in the villages. And so, so I think about that and think about how much we need to have more conversations, more stories. 
you know, mm. more pushing back at traditional ideas. Yeah. And, and, and yes. the way it is, sorry. And I think we're going to need to keep moving. The last person, I want to give a chance to say something. Memory, we haven't heard from you for a bit. Can you give us your, your concluding remarks and then we're going to hand it back to Janet. Yeah, uh, so thank you so much. I think it's so exciting. I mean, there's so much to say, but I think in just a few minutes to say, um, I think we need to also appreciate that there's a lot of pushback in terms of issues around bodily autonomy, uh, issues around choice being perceived as being Western, yet we know that there are some positive um, um, actually African practices, which used to talk and encourage people to talk about sex, about our bodies. And I think we need to start bringing that back into the conversations um, around really comprehensive, um, the beauty around appreciating your body as it is. But I think in concluding, um, just to say that policies are important, but also issues around data, getting the right and quality data to actually end examples around what works. We have Rwanda, but also we have countries like Ghana, for example, when you talk about issues around care work, for example, they put in policies. Ethiopia has put in policies for child care. I know in the audience, we have private sector uh, here, and that it really does work to have you know, policies that are positive um, for women to to be retained um, you know, in employment by ensuring that there's childcare, there's maternal, maternal and paternity leave. So policies cannot exist unless um, the environment uh, also supports uh, the policies. So there has to be a push within and also push without, and most importantly, um, resourcing uh, for those policies. I mean, without money dedicated, to, to move the needle for gender equality, I don't think will go as much far. So having um, the intention or the representation, the resources to really push this agenda. Thank you. Wonderful. Janet, it's back over to you. Thank you so much. I don't think I've ever been, I've been so tempted to literally jump through the screen because of that last bit of the conversation that was taking place with the panel there, because I think when we talk about Africa, it's so led. And as you know, Chimamanda has mentioned, it's rooted in culture and um, patriarchy and a lot of these other things that sometimes are actually the core as to why barriers exist. And, you know, um, Melinda, it was so great when you gave that example of Senegal, Dr. Shivono, also the example that you gave. So I literally wanted to jump through the screen and say, yes, 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 that's actually how we need to tackle it is go back to what are some of the cultural nuances? What are some of the um, barriers to agency? Because again, we're asking women to speak up, but sometimes that comes at a cost. Um, so how do we strip that away and make sure that women and girls are being protected to raise their voices and we have systems that support that agency? Um, and thank you again to Dr. Corin and, and Shiwon for just talking a little bit about the progress um, there in, in Rwanda. I think it's helpful to see. I don't know that we got closing remarks and I know we're over time and the hosts might probably be like, Janet, why would you do this? But I would like to go around the room. Um, we've spoken so much and kind of integrated a lot of issues that are still coming back to access to equity and innovation. Would each of you be able to just kind of surmise and what is your call to action? What is it that you'd like to see happen beyond conversations like this? Maybe you've alluded to it, maybe you haven't, but I'd love to give all of you just a few minutes to talk a little bit about that before we wind up. We can start with you, Melinda, and go around the room. I'd like us to, see, to open up women's full ingenuity all over the continent. We see that women are resilient. We see they've got amazing ideas. We see that when you get enough of them, you know, you get past the 20% to 30, 40, 50%, new policies are made. So we need women at every level. We need them at leadership level. We need them at community level. We need them fully empowered in their homes. And once we get there, we'll break through a lot of these social norms. I'm encouraged. Rwanda's done this in less than 30 years. And so it is possible. And I think when you get that flywheel and that momentum going, then you start to see lots of change across many sectors. Um, I think for me, the biggest push in, in, in any society has to start from political will. Um, where people talk about policies, but they are willing to implement those policies and create opportunities for, for women 
to, to, to sort of like uh, to do better. So policies, I think education, but in terms of accessibility to health, I can't stress enough the importance of universal health care. We are many families, including myself, your one big problem, health problem away from poverty and all the progress that you have made can really, really shudder. And so universal health care, political will and educating the girl child. Yeah, mine is at the family level. I think it's really important to educate our girls, our boys, that this is the norm. Mm -hmm. Anyone has the same opportunity, same chance. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think for me, it's really at community level. Um, I think I would like to see more, um, just more stories, more um, cultural, more cultural production that tries to make women's equality ordinary. Um, not, not, not the sort of thing that portrays a woman as a superwoman, but just makes it ordinary that a woman is CEO and has a family and has her kids and mm -hmm. you know likes lipstick or whatever. But it's completely yes. ordinary. I would love to see more cultural production, films, stories, books, music, whatever fashion that that tries to do that. That's what I would Thank like. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being incredibly passionate, for being at the front lines. We celebrate you because you are advocates for global change. And thank you so much for shedding light and insights into a conversation that will likely continue beyond this. We will wrap it up. Thank you all of you who joined from around the world. Thank you to our esteemed panelists. Uh, we wish you all the very best. And let's remember it's a clarion call to everyone. If we're not at the front lines, if we're not at the table, then progress is slow. We know progress is fragile, but we need to do to be front and center. So thank you all, ladies. Thank you so much for being a part of this. To my co-host, Teresa, to everybody who watched, wishing you an amazing remainder of your time at uh, Chogum. And hopefully we will be able to catch up with you all soon again. But just know you are all very celebrated as women on this panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. A wonderful moderator. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.